with me as usual. I have a panel of experts that's going to help me deliberate and, and develop this topic a bit further and hopefully go into depth and answer the question not only about are we digitally equal but what we can do about it as well. Um, my name is Ilva Rodney Gomeda and I'm a professor of journalism here at, at the University of Johannesburg and right next to me I have uh, Dudu Makwanazi. Lovely to have you with us, Thank uh, you Dudu. And Dudu is the CEO of a project, a non-profit organization called Project Izizwe. And Izizwe works to facilitate uh, free Wi-Fi and access to digital communications and digital communications platforms in low-income communities. And, and I hope you will deliberate more on that and tell us more about the project as well tonight. So lovely to have you here, Dudu. Thank you for having me. And next to Dudu, we have Ryan Smith, who is the Managing Director of BMIT, which is a research and consulting firm that works broadly in the digital uh, uh, industry and with ICTs. Lovely to have you with us, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Very much welcome. And right next to Ryan, we have uh, Chris Borain, who has flown up from Cape Town to be with us. It's lovely. <laughs> Thanks for that, uh, Chris. And Chris is the chairperson of the uh, IAB, which is the Interactive Advertising Bureau of South Africa. And he's also the general manager of uh, One Republic uh, Private Marketplace, uh, which is a, a digital sales uh, platform. Lovely to have you with Thank us, Thank you Chris. very much for inviting me. And last but not least, uh, at the very end of the table, we have my colleague here at UJ, Dr. Wesley Dawsony, who is uh, the senior lecturer in electricity electrical engineering and works on intelligence systems. Very, very warm welcome to you as well. It's lovely to have you here, Wesley. All right. Um, I'd like to kick off the discussion tonight by asking the very, very, very broad and quite open question, but important question. Are we digitally equal? I want to turn women first. Dudu, are we digitally equal? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're not. We're not if we're looking at the fact that, particularly in the South African context, the cost of data, um, the cost of mobile data is expensive, mm -hmm. particularly for people in low-income communities. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the Alliance for Affordable Internet that released their report yes. on the affordability report this year. And it says Africans spend at least 5% of their average income on the cost mm. of data. Now, if you're looking at a South African context with families that earn between 600 mm. to 1,500, that's half of their income that's going to mobile data. Yes. So we're not digitally equal, and it's, it's in such an exploitative and excruciating and an upsetting um, thing that mm. people in low-income communities aren't able to afford opportunities. We're not looking at it as affording the cost mm. of data. It is, if you can afford data, you can afford opportunities. Yes. And therefore, you can afford to be empowered. Mm. And at, as it stands right now, the majority of the country cannot afford mm. opportunities and therefore cannot afford to be empowered. Mm. So the work that we do at Project Disease Way is we're advocate for digital inclusion. And, and I suppose that's why I, I said, no, we're not. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> because we're continuously advocating for digital inclusion, particularly for people in low-income communities. Mm. All our projects are obviously subsidized by the private and public entity. Our argument is that it's not just the government's responsibility to bridge the digital divide, it's everyone's responsibility mm -hmm. that has the financial muscles and that has the resources. Mm -hmm. uh, because the whole world is moving towards digitalization. We're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to go to the US for a 10 day trip around different industries and everyone talks about 5G. If we're talking mm -hmm. about 5G and there are areas in South Africa that don't even have 2G, yes. we are in trouble. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we need to talk about how we can all work together to bridge this divide and as we grow different technologies and different ways to be innovative mm -hmm. and and as we adopt uh, the internet of things that we also simultaneously work on our infrastructure lack and we also work on the pricing of the cost of data mm. no, thank you for that Dudu and I think that you know access of course is, is, is hugely important and providing access and we'll come back to that now I'd like us to touch upon things around how we can improve access as well but um, uh, Ryan do you agree or do you agree? <coughs> no no I certainly do agree um, South Africa certainly has a, a large digital divide mm. uh, in fact a good example is you know a price of one gigabyte of mobile data it's approximately 150 rand mm. 
um, but you can get uncapped fiber internet for around 500 rand, right? But the gap between affording 150 rand per month and 500 rand is, is significant, especially in this economy. There are a lot of people cannot mm. afford 500 rand per month to get that access. Mm. And it's very different what you can achieve mm. once you have uncapped broadband versus one gig of, of data. Yes. Uh, there's significant differences in that, uh, whether it's education, mm. I mean, the amount of uh, content online that allows people to learn things via mm. videos these days, free videos on YouTube, on other uh, platforms, yeah. uh, could enable people who aren't skilled at the moment to, to learn skills by themselves without paying any money for it other than the cost mm. of the data. Um, so there certainly is a massive digital divide and, and unfortunately um, with the fourth industrial revolution mm. where more and more, uh, let's say, human jobs are going to be using technology and guiding technology mm. Uh, without uh, South Africans being technologically literate, um, yeah. we are going to fall further and further behind mm. uh, the rest of the world. So it is seriously something that, that needs to be looked at. And there are a number of different things that, that the public sector specifically, and in some cases the private sector uh, or the public-private partnerships are doing to try and address this. Mm. Um, but you know, we still have uh, problems in South Africa around spectrum allocation mm. is one of the big constraints, which fortunately is now looking to be addressed. Uh, we have a yeah. new telecoms uh, or telecommunications minister, very, very new one. And uh, Sora Ramaphosa has already spoken about wanting to, to allocate this additional mm. spectrum. So hopefully that will allow uh, data prices to fall. And in fact, the, the mobile networks have said uh, if they get spectrum, they can bring down data, data prices. Yes. But we'll yes. wait and see about that. Mm. Um, but it is, it's, it is completely necessary. I mean, we cannot look to be a competitive force uh, on this continent, <coughs> and certainly not in the world, mm. uh, if we don't have the oil in the economy, mm. uh, you know, lubricating the cogs of the economy, which is uh, information and data yes. uh, and access to data. So mm. um, we, we have a great divide, uh, and I think we have to work together to solve it. And it does appear that at least uh, at the very top, there is some impetus into, in terms of addressing this specifically. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, uh, 2019 is the year where we see real progress. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. So 2019, so sort of, you know, we'll, we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely work towards that. Um, I'm going to turn to you, Chris. Uh, you represent a lot of commercial interest, I imagine. Correct. Yep. And um, where, where do you stand with this? Do you see the, the divide as well? So the divide is, is very, very great and unequal um, in the current market and as representing both publishers and agencies what any growth in internet access is good for all of us because it enables more and more people to read the content that we provide from newspapers uh, any form of entertainment content but also educational content so the greater the access to data the greater the access to internet connectivity the more people are able to learn and grow and develop Mm -hmm. um, which then turns into a win for advertising agencies because they are their business opportunities that flow out of that. But I think we just, you know, if we we sitting at the at the tip of the continent, yes. and our data, and I think everybody's has said that already, our data costs are so high, mm -hmm. we're just penalising ourselves further and further. We used to have, we still do have great access to mineral wealth, but unless we have access to intellectual capital wealth. Mm -hmm. um, yes. As a country, we're going to fall further and further behind. Mm. Our economic growth rate is going to stagnate, mm. and our unemployment rate is going to increase. So, um, as Ryan said, it's incumbent on us to do something quickly, and hopefully 2019 is the year that we do something quickly. There is political will. The ANC have made it mm. a one of their charter points to make sure that there is universal access to internet. Um, and the United Nations has declared it a basic human right. So with that, why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we you know, making more of an effort to, to, to create those opportunities? Mm. Yeah. No, thank you for that, Chris. And I think that uh, it's interesting. I'm just watching what's happening online in discussion. And Masiki is saying, you know, yes, dude is absolutely correct. The cost of data is ridiculously expensive and prohibitive to low-income communities. And I think that's the, the baseline. And you all, you know, you've all emphasized that. Uh, Wesley, what do you see? in this space. Thanks, Prof. And, and good evening to, to everyone joining us. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I think we need to think about things in a little bit broader. Much of the discourse surrounding um, digital inequality has been focused towards data access, uh, data costs. 
um, public access. Um, and uh, let's try and imagine for a moment that we wake up tomorrow and we have free, unlimited access. Uh, could we really say that we're digital, digitally equal then? Um, while connectivity alone uh, is, uh, is, is, a, is a condition for, for digital participation, um, it's, it's, it's not uh, sufficient to ensure that um, everyone uh, has uh, kind of equitable uh, rights as a citizen, consumer, and uh, a producer. So uh, we need to look at it from a different angle and say, um, how do we empower people to actually make that access mm -hmm. impactful and sustainable? Um, so we look at some of, some of the uh, Wi-Fi programs, free Wi-Fi programs. Uh, a good example is uh, the Digital Ambassador program uh, that was it, uh, in partnership with UJ and the city. Um, and, and that worked well, but we need to extend that you know, and to, to have much more reach. Um, and we need people to be able to access uh, the digital economy. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Um, one of the things we started here at UJ was um, uh, free classes that we ran every Saturday. Uh, and it, we challenged ourselves, we said it will be open to an, anyone, so anyone could come. And we found that um, uh, the feedback we got afterwards, uh, and we were teaching um, basically uh, philosophies of machine learning, concepts behind there. Uh, we found that some of the suggestions, some of the, the creative and innovative thinking that had come after they had gained this, this new knowledge mm. uh, was things that we would have never thought about. So they had access to those resources mm. before they came to us, uh, online videos and so on. Um, but only with, with that kind of knowledge, it was a, a stepping mm. stone to, to, to activate and stimulate creativity, mm. entrepreneurship, and so on. So I think we need to, to, to look at it from a different perspective and not just focus on on the condition mm. for, for, for digital participation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, we have Jonathan who says online here that I agree with Wesley's thoughts. Uh, connectivity is a ticket through the gate. Uh, uh, it is not the silver uh, bullet solution, but it is a, it's a ticket, it's an, you know, something to, to open doors. And I think that's, that, that is important. So I want to stay with the question of, of then uh, the broader idea of education, you know, or giving, you know, growing uh, a knowledge base. Um, I was just in um, at a conference, a media innovators conference in, in, in Zambia with a lot of people from, from around the, uh, the continent. And what struck me was the, the uh, innovations happening on the continent and young startups in particular, really, really exciting in the media field. And, and I was thinking that, you know, to that kind of, uh, firstly, you need, of course, the knowledge, the know-how, how to do it. You need access to startup finance, capital. You need the education, you know, some kind of an educational background and some kind of digital literacy. I mean, you need the broader literacies as well, of course. Uh, but then also to foster that kind of idea of creativity, uh, a spirit of innovation is also hugely important, I think, in this space. But just in terms of the education, what, 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 what are your thoughts there? Duda, I'll turn to you again. So um, we're very, well, I'm passionate about education yeah. <laughs> and I'm passionate mostly about digital education. Mm. So where you're right, and, and I have to agree with Wesley, is yeah. that the internet, the access to the internet is just the door in. Mm -hmm. what, what's critical, and I think Chris would agree, is the content thereof, the yes. minute you are online. Um, I think there's plenty of content, and, and I speak because the work that we do at ECs where when our users connect to the free Wi-Fi, they yes. immediately get redirected onto the content portal. And we've partnered with various content partners that create e-learning content, uh, job opportunities, and there's there's a lot of content out there. Mm. The, the question is, at especially in education, how certified is it? Um, you're seeing there's a lot of, of courses that are not certified, which is great because it challenges your, mm. your mind. But if, if one were to take these courses, how far does it lead you as a professional? Can, is it accredited? Can you use it? Um, and also around, around education and content, 
can the user, and particularly I speak for people in low income mm. communities, can they engage with the language on the content? Um, and I found I, earlier in the year we were approached by another research um, company within the space, and they were saying, well, we have this program that teaches young people to code and create yeah. their own portal. And I said, well, great, let's, let's do a POC with me and let's start it and, and we'll see. And I couldn't even get through the second part of it because the language was even difficult for me with a master's degree in political mm, science yes. to understand. So when we talk about education and, and pushing educational content online, mm. we have to talk we have to think about language first and foremost and, and we have to think about the, the credibility of the content that we're pushing online and how relevant is it mm -hmm. to the communities that we're trying to empower. Mm -hmm. Education needs to be pitched at the right levels and, and, and language in many, many ways is important there. We've had these discussions before on, on, on the panels that we've had. So, But let's come back to that. I actually, I'm very, very happy. We actually have, Wesley, you're not the, the last man on the table anymore. <laughs> we have a new uh, panelist who just joined us. Lovely to have you here. And he's so Sharamba, welcome. Uh, and you're a technology strategist at um, Altron BSI. And um, we are we are going to come to you now and, and query you on, on some of the questions that we've already. It's all good. I'm just glad I made it here for most Traffic. of this. I have a story. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. Good. story. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> self-driving cars would have been a solution here, oh, or no? Me. Where I was, self-driving cars would it would have been an awful, awful mess. <laughs> it would have been an awful mess. Okay. Um, Anissa, since you came, I've, I've, uh, actually, let me let me go to you. The, one of the first, and the panel tonight, as we know, the discussion is all about equality in the digital space. And the question, the broader question that we're asking is, are we digitally equal uh, in light of the fourth industrial revolution and what it, what it needs in terms of, of, of actually human resources and, and, and knowledge, know-how, and, and so forth? What, is your, what are your thoughts on, on that, Anissa? Are you, do you have any? Um. I don't know if I have thoughts so much as an opinion, because um, my first response would be, I don't think that there is equality. Um, but you'd have to take a step back and ask what your definition of equality actually is. Is it access to the data itself? Is it the access to opportunities? Um, and in that regard, equality, depending on the spectrum of people that you're dealing with, one, it means different things to different people. Um, so. If depending on the education level that you come out of with after your educational career, your definition of what equality to data means hugely differs with somebody that comes out of graduate school because the whole world may be their oyster, they may be looking at international opportunities versus somebody that stopped at high school and they may be looking at what vocational opportunities exist for me and how can I leverage data to that. So the idea of equality is an amorphous one. Uh, but my immediate response would be I don't really think that it's an equal society or play field for anybody mm. at this point. No, we, we're talking about education and how important education is in this space. And I think that there's something, you know, we, we, we see it. And, and Wesley, you were talking about opening up the classroom, giving extra lessons, providing openness. But I think also we, it starts much uh, earlier in life and, and often, you know, early childhood education and primary school education needs to be focused on these things, but which might be rendered nil and void if we don't have access to data access and, and so on, of course, uh, as, as well. But in terms of human resources, and I'm looking at Chris and, and, and Ryan here now, what is needed in this space? Uh, human resources in what sense? In so education-wise, what okay. is it that we need to foster? What is it that we need to do? So. An interesting thing is, if you look at the fourth industrial revolution, which is, you know, we are into the at least the beginning of it. Uh, one observation is that in the future, uh, the types of jobs that are going to be uh, more in demand uh, from a human perspective that wouldn't have been replaced by intelligence or artificial intelligence uh, are ones, in fact, that uh, are more specific around human qualities, things like creativity. Uh, in, in fact, things like engaging with other people. Uh, and it is quite interesting because we live in a society these days where more and more people are get, burying their heads into their devices, um, becoming very, very isolated from other people. Uh, and it has been noted that a lot of you know, 
younger people who are coming into the workforce now actually battle with those types of social skills uh, mm -hmm. and things like that. So one of the, what, you know, when people make suggestions of, oh, well, the types of things that we should be educating people through digital mediums mm -hmm. are things like coding, etc. Yes. There mm -hmm. certainly is value in that. However, I would say that there is still a huge amount of education in the broader sense, not just education into, into technology mm. that can take place through the medium of technology yes. around things that can foster those more human characteristics or human uh, skills, mm. uh, you know, because in 10 years from now, um, people won't be coding the way that we code at the moment. People will be talking to some yeah. voice assistant and the voice assistant will be translating their human voice yeah. into some programming language. So the, the challenge with the fourth industrial revolution specifically is things changing so rapidly that even mm. now it's difficult to know what to teach people. Mm. Uh, and that even the technologies which we, which we have now, mm. uh, teaching them to preschool kids may not even be useful uh, later in life. It's not to say that the concepts aren't useful. Mm. Uh, things like coding are very, very useful, not in the sense of you learning a, a, a programming language, mm but you're learning logic, and mm. logic is an important uh, mm. thing to understand throughout the rest of your life and will always be important. Yeah. Um, but, it, 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 but, I, but I do see that um, those softer skills, if yeah. they can somehow, it sounds a bit counterintuitive, but almost be um, taught through a digital medium, yes. uh, those will also be very, very valuable in the future. Mm. Interesting, so to narrow down the discussion about education, it's more about skills. Would you agree with that, Chris? Um, what would those skills be? I think yes and no. There's what, the, what access allows you to do is, is also gain access to a broader spectrum of people. Mm -hmm. So you're not only reliant on learning skills from your immediate environment. Yeah. If you're able to access a YouTube video, if you're able to access a, a class teaching innovation and entrepreneurship from South Korea or from the United States of America, mm -hmm. that's what internet access to me gives you. It doesn't just it doesn't narrow you down. Mm. It broadens you up and allows you to explore your own world. But I, I also agree with Ryan in the fact that the softer skills are the, going to be the more important skills. Yeah. It allow, it'll allow us to, to work with other humans, to interact with other humans, mm. and to learn from them. And in doing that, so engage and start creating your own opportunities. Mm. But I think, I mean, to, to Wesley's point, I think, and we, we've all spoken about this earlier, Internet access is the gateway. Without that, yeah. you don't have anything. And I think that's, let's get that right. Mm. We, we, there are a lot of things that we need to do mm. post that. We need yeah. to provide educational standards mm. because there will be, you know, there'll be people coming and offering courses that won't meet various standards yeah. and those that, you know, that won't actually teach anybody anything anyway. Mm. We need to teach people about safety on, on the internet. Yeah. Mm. What what is fake, what is real, how to, you know, how to see the difference in those. Mm. You, as, you as a journalism professor would know that. Mm. You know, fake news is, is something that's very prevalent in the world at the moment. Mm. Brand safety, how you keep people in an environment which is trusted. Mm. And all those aspects make up an important part of digital access, mm. as do getting the right content in front of people, making mm. sure that the standards are right, mm. and then letting them explore, mm. letting them explore and language, to your earlier point, is critical. Mm. If we are not, if we're only teaching in English, mm. we're certainly not going to help. We need to be broadening the base. We have a number of official mm. languages. We should be teaching people in those number of mm. official languages when we can, when there is opportunity to do that, mm. whether that's subtitles or whatever that is, but just allowing people to learn at their own pace, mm. but seeing the same concepts and making those concepts universal. Mm. It's interesting because I've uh, online here now as well. Actually, this, it, it's uh, uh, we have both Masiki and Jonathan who's been with us and, and um, uh, throughout the debate here, and it's talking about just it, exactly these. You know, th they, they, there's a there's a whole um, cluster of things that we need to solve, and it's not an either or scenario. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, access is going to be the, the the major issue. But we can provide access, but if we don't have the literacies, then that's, you know, that might not be, be everything. So, um, Anisu, what, what are your thoughts on it? <coughs> I completely agree with what everybody, uh, what everybody said. I think it's one of those issues where, where do you start fixing it to get everybody equal access? Because there is an element of giving people access to the right skills. 
um, there is an element of making sure that those skills are relevant mm -hmm. from a local level to regional to an international level. So education is important. And there's an element of uh, infrastructure play as well and government policy because that plays into it as well. Who, who takes the lead on that? Um, because a lot of the, if I understand this correctly, a lot of the coverage that allows for connectivity is determined on a market basis as opposed to a, uh, the best interest of the public basis. So wherever the market is, is where the coverage will be. Therefore, that <coughs> by definition excludes certain elements of the population from access to data. Mm. So because it's not a, a public policy issue um, to the extent that it should be, access to data is restricted on a profit basis. Mm. So it's basically that element of who takes the lead on that front. Mm. And because it's primarily driven from a profit motive, because um, there are shareholders that everybody has to answer to. It's then also a case of um, what can be done to lower the cost to make access cheaper for everybody that does have access. Um, and then the other vector to that everybody at some point will need to address is if cost is taken care of and infrastructure is taken care of, who should take the lead on that? If you leave it to companies, they will do what's in the interest of their shareholders. If you leave it to government, mm -hmm. it becomes a case of how do they finance that? Because they have other responsibilities from education to healthcare as well. Um, so I agree with everyone. I guess my question to everybody would be, it's such a big issue to tackle yeah. that who takes the lead, how, when, and as somebody's taking the lead, mm -hmm. um, where does that leave the country in relation to the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. We did, uh, Dudu, you mentioned it first, I think, this idea of public-private partnerships and, and, and Ryan and Chris as well, it's, it, which are hugely important, but how do you furnish that? How do you actually then, because what Anise is pointing out is that there might be different interests at, at play. So is it, a, is it a government that has to take the lead on this and tell <coughs> the private sector what to do? I don't know, Chris, do you have any thoughts on? Um. I'm never in favour of government taking the lead and in informing, com of, you know, where it should happen because I think <laughs> what happens then is you, you, there are different forces at play. I think in all of this it needs to be a partnership. Mm -hmm. So if I as a commercial player want to offer free Wi-Fi access in the urban areas, mm -hmm. to get that access I should be offering that in the rural areas. So everything that you do comes with a it's not just a one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. or a one opportunity. It's we're going to be offering it here. Mm -hmm. The opportunity cost for you to do that mm -hmm. is by offering it in a different area to a different market. And I think that there are a number of ways of funding this, whether it be grant funding, whether it be just purely commercial funding and advertising-based funding. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to sit down and work out those funding models sooner rather than later. Because mm -hmm. if, we, if we fight around that and we go, okay, well, we're going to wait for government to take the lead. Mm -hmm. or we're going to wait for commercial to take a lead, nobody's going to take a lead, we're all going to sit back and wait. Mm -hmm. So I think <clears throat> we've got to strike while the iron's hot, we've got to strike while next year's election year. Mm -hmm. Government and political parties are going to be making promises that they can't hopefully afford to, to do hope that half the time, but we've mm -hmm. got to make them stick to it. We've got to say you've said that universal internet access is a key policy decision, yeah. right now what's the next step? Let's work together to create that, to create free internet access, mm. to allow it, to allow minimum downloads a day, to allow people to access educational infrastructure or inf mm. you know, educational programs. We've got the opportunity next year because everybody's going to be wanting to, to really attract the electorate mm. and make them want to, you know, vote for them, and uh, so that's how we do it. Mm. Do you agree with that, Dudu? I've been nodding the whole time. <laughs> 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 he basically just took all our model and said it in one word. Yeah. Um, Private-public partnerships is what ECISA has been doing mm. uh, for the last four years now. And and again, you know, sustainability is very key. I think for every non-for-profit, whether you're focusing on digital access yeah. or, or you're focusing on education uh, or empowering women who are homeless, I think yeah. if you're a non-for-profit or if you're a social enterprise, you need to look at sustainability. Mm. And, um, and, and around public access, sustainability has been an issue. Having been in the space mm. for the pa past five mm. years, at Project Decisor, we understand there's no silver bullet to it. There's, there's definitely different mm. avenues that we can we can look at, and we have been testing different sustainable revenue mm. models. And um, 
It's quite interesting. It's quite interesting in a sense that, um, and I, I'll probably challenge Chris in this. Yeah. Uh, we've we've looked at advertising, which is one of that's what everyone sells. I mean, I was in New York early this year, and Link NYC saying they're funding their New York public Wi-Fi yes. with advertising. And I was like, great. How are you doing it? Because we've been struggling for the past five years in South Africa. Um, with advertisers, mm. it's it's it boils down, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it boils down to filling the inventory. It also boils down with the LSM of the advertisers. Is it the target market that they're looking at? Yeah. And where we have these public access networks, the yeah. LSM isn't particularly what is attractive to the advertiser, right? So you're looking at, you growing this network, you have people connected, and how are you making this sustainable? When mm. you reach out to an advertiser and they say, oh, not my target market, this is a lower LSM. Mm. Right, and and so that's become again. It goes back to let's try other sustainable revenue models. I'm completely open to advertising. Mm. I'm, I'm mm. a propeller of advertising. But the question is, how do we make it work, and how do we get advertisers on board to understand mm. that? And and you know, I I get really passionate about this because the biggest consumers are people in low income communities, mm. and 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 a lot of our hotspots are in public areas where at taxi ranks, at, at sh um, not shopping malls, at community centers, mm. even at police stations. Mm. And that's where people congregate, and that's where people purchase things. So again, it goes back, it, peop it is people in low income communities that prepay for data, mm. and they are the ones that pay more, as opposed to people in, who are rich that pay mm. rarely less. So again, you know, advertisers, are you willing to partner <laughs> with public access partners to, to make public access sustainable? Because peeling the inventory and then the lower LSMs mm. just probably does not fit your spec mm. of the line. I, I don't think that's the answer at all, actually. I think, well, not that, not that we don't want to fill those advertising slots. I think, firstly, there's no, there is no silver bullet for everything. There has mm. to be a mix of models in mm. there. But secondly, you're right, people in lower income groups well, they are they purchases. They buy the same goods as everybody else does. Uh, Coca Cola is, wanting to be, is going to be wanting to hit them, and or you know, there are a number of different advertising opportunities that you can that you can get. I think it's speaking to the right salespeople mm. and having those salespeople speak to the right advertising agencies mm. and the right brands and the right partnerships because partnerships ultimately will will make this happen. Mm. Um, I think just on that point, yep. uh, one of the challenges, though, is in the in the digital adver advertising space is that there's a glut of inventory, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of people, or a lot of businesses who think, well, we have all these eyeballs and we've got mm -hmm. this advertising space mm -hmm. and, and we count up our impressions mm -hmm. and we work out mm -hmm. how much we can sell each impression for mm -hmm. and, you know, now we've funded our whole model. The challenge is that a lot of people are doing that. Sure. There's more inventory than what there is demand, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, and most publishers, uh, you know, publishers who are, who are producing content and, and drawing huge amounts of eyeballs uh, to their websites mm. are also struggling. You, know, you see, um, you know, digital divisions of certain publishers having to downsize mm. because there isn't enough demand. Um, unfortunately, this is one of the challenges uh, with the, the changing way of advertising. Mm. Uh, as, as a lot of advertising moves into social, mm. uh, or moves into other different environments, off of these presences. Um, it makes it more difficult for any person who has uh, advertising inventory mm. to monetize it. Mm. And I think that's more of the concern than anyone particularly having uh, any issue with um, the eyeballs and project to see mm -hmm. I think there's certainly lots of advertisers that want to go after so that. So that is a bit of a, of, a, of a flaw in the model. But yeah, I'm glad that you highlighted that, Dudu. Uh, and he said, you're dying to say something on that point. Oh, it's not so much <laughs> that I'm dying to say anything. I think, Dudu, just how passionate you got about the entire uh, revenue model. Yeah. Usually there's a mic drop moment in most of these <laughs> debates where somebody could just be like, yeah, I'm done. It doesn't work. <laughs> That was yeah. That was it. I don't have anything. Yes, you're right. It's a thumbs up. <laughs> it's a thumbs up. But the the I mean, it's it's how do we solve access? So private partnership. There are models that you've been working with. Uh, there are things in in the advertising space that could feed into that model, managed correctly, and so on. Um, Wesley, do you agree? How do we facilitate access? Is it just about private partnership? Is it, are there other issues to think about? Yeah, um, I've just been listening to lot of the you know a lot of the, the ideas and suggestions um, we tend to go to government as well mm -hmm. always 
um, there's a whole issue around spectrum and uh, mm. the regulator and so on. Yeah. So um, I think we have some, some really good policies. We do. Mm. Uh, we have some really good policies, but mm. we don't really see them through. The reason being uh, is what was mentioned, uh, you know, all stakeholders need to be engaged. Mm. Um, and I haven't heard any suggestion or any model about engaging uh, the people that's using using the uh, you know uh, the access yeah. um, and how would they come up with any ideas mm. on how they think they could sustain it in their community mm. I think that would be interesting to find out uh, because we we always talk about uh, you know kind of the uh, give a man a fish model you know it's it's only going to last for a certain mm. amount of time what about teaching him to fish he won't go yeah. hungry so so um, <coughs> There, there's also elements, and I want to come back to the to, to the education part. It, yeah. it went to education, but I mentioned knowledge. Mm. Knowledge is a very important part of it. Um, so the other aspects is um, uh, not not necessarily looking at skills, but better living. Mm. So you could look at um, access to the municipal services that mm. you have around uh, through this uh, free, free uh, public Wi-Fi, mm. um, access to uh, job portals. Mm -hmm. um, access to programs in the DST, Department of Labor, um, you know, the NRF, uh, mm. and you know, uh, innovation agencies, mm. finding out how, how they can get to innovation hubs, for example. Mm. So, so you're trying to build something more than just access mm -hmm. around uh, the access. Um, and, and in that way, um, we can start looking at different models where uh, the people that are using it mm. can begin to think about how they will sustain it mm. instead of you know um, waiting for the access to, to continue yeah. I mean it's interesting you know you and I are both uh, you know university uh, lecturers and, and university campuses are microcosmoses of the world so you know if you can if you can if you can find the right partnerships that can sponsor university projects maybe that's uh, you know a good way to start somewhere because what I want to ask is, is there a tipping point here where then access and education meet and we have some kind of, you know, a real kind of, you know, um, opening up of this space and, and, and where we can really do fantastic things and where we generated enough know-how that it sort of, you know, becomes sustainable and feeds itself. Any thoughts on that, a tipping point? So um, <clears throat> we have a project, so I mentioned we do private-public partnerships. We have mm. a project with another non-for-profit called Aware.org. And Aware.org is a non-for-profit that advocates against um, underage drinking. And Aware reached out to CISWA sometime last year and they said, well, the whole world is going digital. Mm. And we've partnered with other partners, there's six other partners around research, around education, and around content. Mm -hmm. And we want a partnership with ECSWAY to roll out free Wi-Fi hotspots in Bushburgridge and Butabelo. So this is in the Nelspread and, and, and the Free State. And we want to use this free Wi-Fi hotspot as an enabler for our intervention program against um, anti-underage drinking. And it's been such an amazing program to observe because we, as Project Disease Way, walk and we partner with the local ISP. We do the deployment and we plug in the portal that, that's zero rated that the users, um, that's the first point of contact before mm -hmm. the user can browse. And what AWARE then does is they push all this content around um, underage drinking and the dangers of underage drinking. Mm -hmm. And some of these hotspots, we've deployed some of the routers at the schools and with the other partners that they have that are linked to the educational program. So we've had multiple stakeholder engagements also with the Department of Education in these, bo in these two regions. And, and so they've taken this um, anti-underage drinking campaign and incorporated it into life orientation. So it's like, um, yeah. an extra moral activity for life orientation. But the results thus far, I mean, we have 12 months to, to, to do this and we're, we're not done yet, we're almost there. Mm. But it's, it's been amazing and mind boggling as to how access and education around a particular, you know, anti, um, underage drinking yeah. is what we're doing now, 
has just changed not only the culture within the community, but within the school. So I got an email from one of the teachers a few months ago, yeah. and she said, you know what, I'm so grateful for the free Wi-Fi because we used to get a lot of um, absenteeism, mm -hmm. and now a lot of kids are coming to school because we allow them to now use their devices and interact with the program. Um, and now there's free Wi-Fi at school, so who wouldn't want to come to school? Mm. And, and we've then deployed these free Wi-Fi hotspots around the um, spaza shops and the tech shops. And mm. again, to go back to, Wes, uh, to Wesley's point, the communities guard these hotspots. And yeah. where we are with aware.org is that this is a, this is a proof of concept. Mm. They want to get information and they're doing research around how internet access can be an enabler mm. for an intervention program and, and other points around that. But once the program is done, we go back to sustainability. And, yeah. and I like a way of thinking is how do we then turn this funded model, the subsidized model, and create um, and make it into a community network. So what we do at Project mm. is we work with another um, social enterprise called the Social Collective, where we've taken young people, we call them Wi-Fi ambassadors, and we've trained them, and they work with the local ISP that we mm. work with. The idea is that towards the end of this, these ambassadors can know how to drive this and therefore run this as a community network. But it's been very interesting to see how the community of both Bushbrook Ridge and Butabelo mm. interact with us. And these are very rural communities. I mean, Bushbrook Ridge, in a day, we get about 1,400 mm. 1, users on just these 15 hotspots. Mm. So uh, two questions that I want to pose, and they're, they're sort of coming out from from the, the questions that are uh, being fed to me here online as well, and the discussion that's ongoing online. I mean, firstly, I'm going to come back to data costs and how we can deal with data costs and keep them lower. But there's one question here as well about then uh, uh, platforms and devices. So yes, free Wi-Fi access, but what, what about devices? Uh, not everyone has access to smartphones and so on. And there's a question being fed here by Jonath uh, Jonathan that says, um, does digitally equal have to be internet and smartphone based from the get go? Sure, it's sexy, he says, but what about utilizing simpler access such as USSD uh, and uh, WAP? Any thoughts on that? I see you nodding, Wesley. I think yeah. the devices is probably a, a huge, uh, well, you can do amazing things with a smartphone right yeah. now, if you have one. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there are programs where uh, we uh, have, uh, you know, give, give iPads to, to kids yeah. and uh, so on and so on. Uh, but, you know, that's, again, once again, not sustainable. It, 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 can't, be, it can't be broad and wide, mm -hmm. the reach. Uh, so we should start looking uh, very seriously at um, uh, lowering the cost of devices. Yeah. Um, and uh, of course, uh, that points to local production, mm. local manufacturing, local production, which mm. is, uh, which has its own challenges. Um, but uh, you know, there they they have been some success stories mm. with that, particularly with mobile phones. Yeah. Um, and it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. But but definitely driving the uh, cost of uh, devices down. Mm. Um, is, is, is certainly a condition also mm. for, for participation, yeah. Yes. I just think on that point, I uh, certainly agree that um, the cost of the device is also yeah. very very much a barrier. Um, uh, the, the idea of saying, well, can we use USSD, yeah. uh, WAP, and things like that, um, is, is, there is there is some merit in that. But at the same time, you're still maintaining quite a digital divide mm. by only allowing a certain mm. type of access mm. uh, yeah. versus a smartphone, where there's obviously <coughs> greater possibilities. Sorry, Ryan, can I interrupt uh, sure. you? Can you explain to us what is USSD and VAP? Okay, well, WAP was a WAP. protocol which was used a number of years ago, yeah. and I don't know to what extent it's, it's still used today, but for uh, USSD, yeah, yeah, for, yeah. for 2G devices. Yeah. Uh, but uh, USSD, people use it commonly when you want to check your um, airtime balance or something and you enter a star number code oh, and a right. hash and then you can yeah. access menus of information through that mechanism mm. that doesn't actually doesn't actually rely on the, the type of data that we're talking about now um, but one interesting idea is why not making certain low-end smartphone devices um, that's exempt so you actually say yeah. let's make these devices that mm. exempt not mm. make people pay 15 percent extra mm. and the government can actually do that quite easily yeah. Um, whether they want to do it or not is different, or whether they can afford to do it or not. Uh, but it's quite a simple mechanism to actually make a certain uh, type mm. of device. Interesting. And it might be that it's local devices only. Uh, 
do you want to stimulate that that environment? Mm. I mean, there was very recently uh, or, or this year uh, a smartphone factory launched uh, down in, yeah. in, in East London. Um, uh, so there are these types of things that are happening, yeah. uh, and certainly getting more of these. Uh, data-enabled or smart devices into people's hands mm. uh, is important uh, as that first step of the journey. Um, so what are the barriers towards lowering data costs and, uh, you know, lower cost them for, for devices? Any thoughts on that from you? Uh, any panelists? Like when we talk about uh, cheaper access to devices um, or producing devices locally, it's basically an saying that there's an element of the invisible hand, the markets at play. Um, and it was such that, what, five, six, ten years ago, a smartphone was impossible for anybody to have. Yeah. Now it's not unheard of to pick up a Show Me Chinese phone for 1,500 Rand and you're connected to the internet, or less, and connected to the internet immediately. Yeah. yeah. And it's, that, that's a lot of money. But it's the, the point there is that five years ago, there was a whole uh, demographic segment of the market that didn't have access. Mm -hmm to the internet. Now, because of the market at play, uh, prices have dropped to the extent that people can jump on. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that there, that there probably does need to be some element of government intervention to make sure that everybody can get access to devices. But I'm, a, I'm something of a firm believer in saying sometimes letting the market work itself out will eventually drive down costs, provided that there is sufficient competition in there, provided that other elements are enabled, whether it's a case of spectrum allocation or data migration that therefore opens up that lane so that smaller players can come in. And elements like that eventually do dry down costs. The issue there is how long does that take and can people wait for that to happen? If we want to locally produce devices, for example, where do we get the funding? Where do we get the, the money? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's a number of different avenues to take. I mean. Uh, pretty certain that the DTI is, uh, would be a supporter of those types of uh, efforts. Um, and again, um, uh, the private sector uh, certainly comes to the party in that regard as well. And in fact, um, yeah, I mean, different types of uh, ways of, of funding these different mechanisms. Uh, in some cases, I've even heard of the fact that uh, the money saved in certain stock files have been used to, so, uh, to, to actually help kick some of these uh, very digital uh, projects off the ground. So there's a, there's a wide range of um, uh, avenues. I mean, in South Africa, mm. you know, we don't necessarily have the same type of culture around angel investors and things like that. So mm. it's very difficult for people who don't have um, uh, a business that's already running to get additional funding. Yeah. So that's one of the challenges that, that we face. Yeah. Um, but I do see that there are certain funds typically aimed at, at SMEs as well. There's a technology fund, I can't recall, mm. that's in the Western Cape that mm. just uh, recently mm. uh, made an investment, I think it was this week, uh, as one of their first uh, investments into the, the tech mm -hmm. space. Um, so the hope is that uh, we see a, a bit more of that. Yeah. Chris? Media24 have just launched a one and a half billion rand technology investment fund as well. So. so there's a lot of money that's at play there. Yeah. Just to get back to the handsets again. I again would be a firm believer in the hand of the market as opposed to yeah. if we can get and import phones cheaply, yeah. good quality phones cheaply from our partners, you know, other, other members of the BRICS nations, mm -hmm. China are able to deliver them at a significantly cheaper cost than we can do now. I think the important aspect for me is get devices into the hands of people, mm -hmm. get internet access. Mm -hmm. We will grow the technology, we will grow the development mm -hmm. of new industries, of new mm -hmm. opportunities for people, um, and then let people like NASPAS, who have this one and a half billion rand mm -hmm. fund, let them climb in and encourage innovation and entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. give people access to education, that they then go, well, these are the opportunities, mm -hmm. this is what we can do. And I think it's, it is always going to be, there has to be the hidden hand of the market, mm -hmm. but also yeah. the very visible hand of government intervention to go, we need to go this way. Mm -hmm. We need to legislate that there will be free internet mm -hmm. access. Right, market, go and do it. Mm -hmm. So but the policy environment. So, yeah, and I think we do have a very, very strong policy environment. Mm -hmm. These things are in place already. It's now, it's taking, taking the bull by the horns mm -hmm. and making sure that the policy framework and guidelines are implemented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wesley, I see you have some thoughts yes. as well. Yeah. 
Um, I think uh, j just looking at, uh, you know, the for example, the energy space. Yeah. Um, previously, we had this similar issues. You know, it's cheaper to, to yeah. import some of the solar PV <coughs> panels. Um, and uh, one of the things that drove the cost down tremendously globally and in South Africa is our renewable energy independent power producer uh, bidding process, yeah. the model. And it was a very innovative model. It worked really well. It helped to drive the prices down. Yeah. Um, you know, so something, something similar, uh, in, instead of having uh, you know, the difficulties with the, the manufacturing, mm. drawing in uh, competitors from mm. uh, the international yep. mm. uh, sector. We still face the problem, though, of high data costs. And yep. it comes up in discussions online again, again and again and again. again. But what about the data costs? How can we keep, how can we lower the cost of data. And maybe you should ask, why are they so high? Um, yeah, I mean, it depends on which segment of the market you're yeah. looking at. But I think most people, when they talk about data cost, they're specifically looking at mobile data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and there's a number of different reasons that many people will give you around why data costs are very high. If they're the mobile networks, uh, they'll specifically say, well, one of the biggest constraints is the spectrum. Yeah. And, the, and it, is, it is true that South Africa is lagging immensely in terms of allocating spectrum. Yeah. Um, and that the challenge with that is to maintain certain standards on their networks. They have to employ quite uh, complex, up, well, not, quite expensive upgrades to the existing uh, towers yeah. just so that they can provide the same level of service over very small amount of spectrum that they might have. Mm. So that's the one side of the story. The other side of the story is, um, you know, mobile networks uh, have existed for, a, a very, um, for, for let's just say, 20 years uh, mm. in South Africa and have been very, very profitable organizations uh, for a very long time that have shareholders that expect certain levels of profit, yeah. right? Uh, mm. And if you are uh, an executive at one of mm. those organizations, it is very difficult to now start reducing mm. costs uh, like that. And the challenge is, uh, the problem is, especially for the large networks, yeah. um, because it's, it's not that competitive in South Africa, because we, mm. we have two quite large players and, and, and the other guys are quite small, what you find is that the small guys might reduce their prices to mm. try and get some customers, and in some cases they're fairly successful with that. Yeah. But the bigger players are very reluctant to drop their prices even to match that, because yeah. what happens is that even though they're losing a few customers, the net de um, loss that they'll make by dropping their data prices across their, all, their entire customer mm. base is significantly greater than the small number, the small loss that they're making by mm. losing customers. So they would rather uh, lose uh, a few customers here and there th due to that mm. process than bring data across prices mm. uh, down across the board. Mm. Um, so it is quite difficult in that regard. So government has spent a lot of time thinking about what to do in this, and then there is a new ECA amendment act looking at. Mm. Uh, communications, which is very, very, very hotly debated, mm. uh, and is probably going to be challenged in court, uh, uh, almost certainly so. Mm. Uh, and one of the ideas is uh, that the government has is to introduce what is called a wireless open access mm. network, mm. which is to create a wholesale layer uh, to the mobile network where <coughs> other players can then come in and be almost like a mobile ISP mm. and offer a mobile network type service without mm. necessarily having the infrastructure. They get it from a wholesale provider. Uh, and this is, in the mind of government and in, in people who ad advocate for it, yeah. uh, hopefully would allow a sort of control of the, the base costs uh, and, 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 and make sure that infrastructure isn't duplicated, where it shouldn't be duplicated, yeah. uh, and allow more competition uh, in that environment, like what we've seen in the fixed line, uh, yeah. let's say mm -hmm. fiber environment, where yeah. there is this wholesale model mm -hmm. with an ISP layer mm -hmm. on top. Uh, it's, 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 it's a very, very contentious debate yeah. at the moment, uh, of the most contentious. So we, we're running out of time, so to try to wrap up the discussion, 2019 was mentioned as a crucial year. Something's going to happen in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, uh, Brian, you presented a view here of, of some government initiatives that, that, you know, that could work and the, the open access network then that, 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 that might have ripple effect. Any other big things that you think are necessary or are already happening and that need to happen for that decisive moment in 2019? Do you do? <laughs> so I think, you know, I'm, um, with Project DCs, we're all for the WON. We believe in the WON. I think yeah. I've written so many letters <laughs> to DTV as in the minister, yeah. back, like how we're passionate about the WON. I think 
we have a monopoly problem and you know working with local wireless internet service providers we believe wireless is is cheaper and it's easy to disrupt um but and i feel where mobile network operators don't quite see that is because data is really a, a, a addictive is that if you have if you're at a local public hotspot yes. and you're connected to wireless access which is cheaper and it's way you know way better and and more affordable than fiber connectivity once you move away from the public hotspot because you're so used to the activity on the phone you will eventually start using your mobile data yeah. i think that that is the message that mobile network operators need to to understand yes. that you know sharing and 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 opening mm. spectrum and and also just allowing wireless isps to piggyback on infrastructure because i would i would know we work a lot with these wireless um internet service provider it's yeah. just difficult to put up uh, a mask yes. in and a place that's not connected and i think another thing is in areas like the northern cape where there is no connectivity there's almost no fiber mm -hmm. in areas like pof ada mm -hmm. and and kemos and, and kakamos is that let us look at other initiatives and let us include mm -hmm. that in policies right so ikasa needs to act very fast around mm. allowing the test of tv white space and allow and and let's look at other technologies like satellite mm. that will then use wireless as backhaul to connect those that are not connected mm. as opposed to using traditional fiber so that's a, a government approach then and that it just like like Ryan said chris and uh, any last I, I would hold thoughts the politicians to account. yes <laughs> <laughs> so in every single promise that they make leading into the election and in every single promise that they've made leading up to the last number of years, the elected conference, but particularly into the elections. Yeah. When a politician stands up and goes, we will offer free internet access, it's a basic human right and it's part of mm -hmm. our election, election manifesto. Mm -hmm. Right. Can we see that in writing and can we see that being implemented now? Mm -hmm. Not after the elections. Let's roll it out now so that we can start benefiting our people sooner rather than later. I think holding holding government to account and then holding the private sector to account mm. equally. They are just as responsible. Yeah. Everybody needs to work together, but we need to do it now. Wesley, mm. any? Yeah, um, free education and so I, <laughs> yes. you know, why not uh, free uh, open access as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think I'm going to just probably end off by saying how I started is that I think there's going to be um, quite a, a rapid growth in digital skills mm -hmm. yes. um, development and transformation. There's going to be uh, uh, quite quite an extensive amount for that mm -hmm. in all different sectors, uh, public, private, and so on. Out of time, so quickly. Yeah, yeah. I think um, <laughs> I don't think anything major. I think a lot of things are going to be said in 2019. I don't think that we're necessarily at a tipping point. I think that there's still a lot of momentum being built. Um, and I think it'll probably take another two years or so before anything major happens. But there will be builds of sustainability happening, um, communities finding ways to prop up their own uh, routes to connectivity, and I think government will take steps. I think the market will begin migrating in that direction. But those are all moving parts that will all find their way to a destination we all hope to get to. Yeah. It's just not going to happen in time within the next 12 to 18 months. All right, so you know, but we're, we're hopeful for 2019, and I think that it is the data access that we talked about is absolutely important, education, but also then bringing that open access into the education system to fuel something, and then maybe we'll have this tipping point then that you know where, where actually the access meets then education, and we have some kind of exponential growth in this area of know-how and access, hopefully. And I, so I want to thank you all for for, for those insights. I think it's been. been Absolutely, I've learned a lot and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and I hope that we can continue this discussion as well because it is absolutely important. And we need to find solutions and I think that we'll be very solution oriented on this panel tonight which is, which is absolutely lovely. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. And thank you all at home for, for, for participating online and, and engaging in this discussion and we hope to uh, uh, see you all next year as well where we're going to continue these discussions on a regular basis. And I'm wishing you all a lovely December break and keep safe on the roads and, and enjoy.